Good evening. Good evening. It's wonderful to have you all here. I'm Ivo Dollar, the President of the Chicago Council on, on Global Affairs, and I'm really delighted to welcome Secretary uh, Henry Paulson and Annette Luce uh, back to our stage. Uh, we're on the record tonight. We're live streaming. Uh, please uh, tweet, pin, whatever, insta something, as long as you do it with the phones that are now uh, silenced. Uh, this is our last public program of the season. Uh, so I want to start off by thanking uh, an incredible staff at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for everything they do to make these kinds of uh, programs possible. In fact, they'd like you to, to uh, join me in thanking them. Uh, we're at, I think, program number 200 and some. 35,000 attendees and over 6,500 people are watching live uh, through live streaming. So uh, we're, we're making an impact. Um, this may be the end of the season, but we'll be back in the fall. We're looking forward to have uh, Neil Ferguson, Gary Kasparov, uh, Amory Slaughter, Dennis Ross, and many others, Ben Bernanke, uh, many others to come back here. And I hope to see all of you at these programs. Now, Back to what we're here for tonight. We're very excited to welcome Hank and Ed back to the council. Both have participated in the inaugural Chicago Forum on Global Cities last month and we were, uh, that we were grateful to be able to host here in Chicago. As many of you know, Hank has been a critical component of the America's engagement with China for many decades. As CEO of Goldman Sachs and as U.S. Treasury Secretary, he has played a critical and fascinating role in opening up China to the world. In the process, uh, uh, Hank had the opportunity to work with many of China's leading politicians, including its three most re recent premiers. And today, Hank is president of the Paulson Institute, uh, which works to foster cooperation between China and the United States on economic and environmental matters. We're grateful to have the opportunity to partner with the Paulson Institute today uh, on, on many great uh, China-focused programs. Um, we're glad that Hank has recorded his unique experiences and perspectives in his new book, Dealing with China, and we look forward to hearing more uh, about his experiences. Signed copies will be available for purchase after the program. In conversation with Hank tonight is Ed Luce, who is the chief U.S. correspondent for the Financial Times. Ed's worked with the FT as a Philippines correspondent, Capital Markets Editor, South Asia Bureau Chief, and Washington Bureau Chief. Previously. Ed served as his chief speechwriter for Lawrence Summers, the U.S. Treasury Secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary Paulson and Ed Luce. Thank, thanks, Evo. Um, thank, thanks for that introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure, um, Hank, if I may call you Hank, to save time. Um, Secretary Paulson, on first reference, Hank no, from then on. Hank always. Hank always, okay. Uh, uh, great pleasure to be with you, um, uh, Hank. Um, I, I enjoyed your book greatly, and I couldn't help thinking as I was reading it that there are really two Henrys when it comes to America and China, one of whom, of course, is Henry Kissinger uh, on foreign policy, and the other is Henry Hank Paulson, um, on economic engagement with China. Um, and your um, background with China doesn't go back quite as long as Henry Kissinger's, but you probably made more trips there. Um, I know you count, but uh, it's probably, uh, what, 150 by now? N not that many, but well over 100. It's well over 100. Um, talk, talk to us a little bit, just set the stage a little bit as to why you wrote this book um, on what you hope Americans and people from other parts of the world who are anxious, wary, keenly curious about a rising China should get out of it? Well, that's, a, that's an, a, a quite an open-ended uh, question, but I, I would say this. The, you know, my, my first book was On the Brink, which was on the financial crisis, and that was, you know, you know emotionally difficult to, to write right after leaving Treasury. And I, 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 I usually get a laugh when I say this, but it was, it was very serious at the time. When I told Wendy, my wife, I was going to write another book, she said, I think I'll date again. But so, and, but, 
but, but this was a more difficult book to write because I thought it was going to take 18 months and it took uh, the better part of four years. And what the reason I wrote it, and, and I, I dedicated it to my grandchildren, and because I really believe, I, you know, I want them to grow up in a peaceful, you know, environmentally sound, pr prosperous world. And uh, I think the odds are much greater of doing that if we have a, you know, a, a strong relationship with China and much more difficult if we don't. I believe that although there's great interest, and one thing I've seen, I've now had a number of meetings like this around the United States, and I find there's great interest in China, and there's a lot of concern about China right now, and not a high level of understanding. And I believe this is by far the most important bilateral relationship, the U.S.-China, not just for U.S. and China, but for the world for this century. Uh, there are not a lot of examples. I can't find examples in history of a uh, of a established power and a rising power not coming to blows into conflict. Someone the other day said, what about the U.S. and the U.K.? But, you know, they don't really know their history. They burned our White House down in 1812. And, and so it, it's unthinkable to me that we do come to blows. Uh, and so I look at it and say, here is a country that is now, it's a more complex, difficult relationship. They've emerged as a formidable competitor on the one hand, uh, but yet we have th this mutual interest dependency, really, these shared interests on a wide range of important topics. And if we are going to make progress in curbing the risk of climate change, uh, keeping the global economy growing, uh, dealing with the nuclear threat or terrorism or cyber or whatever, we're, we're going to, it's going to be much easier if we figure out how to work with the Chinese in complementary ways and much more difficult if we don't. So again, the purpose of this book, and it was a bit of a pun with dealing with China, but it, it really is, the purpose of the book is to, to give people a sense of what I've learned and, uh, and to help you know, explain what I see going on in China and then the, the importance of working with them. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing you on and off for almost 10 years now because you, uh, I first interviewed you as a journalist um, when you were appointed as George Bush's third Treasury and most consequential, I think, by far, Treasury Secretary in, in mid-2006. Now, you'll probably be remembered more here for the book you wrote previously on the brink, but one of the first acts that you took was to set up, and I think part of your negotiations with President Bush in, in taking the job was to set up the strategic economic dialogue with China, the first bilateral institutionalized engagement between if you like, the existing power and the rising one that we've had. And by coincidence, we're now this week in Washington in the seventh annual um, strategic ec and economic dialogue, as it's now known, um, with China. So my question to you is, given all the difficulties we've been having in the last year or three with China, in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, with the cyber theft, the largest in history of federal government personnel, data, and so on. Is dialogue enough to engage and shape the behavior of a rising China? Is dialogue, obviously it's necessary, but is it sufficient? It's, I, I think it's desirable and necessary, but not sufficient. But I'll, I'll talk a minute about the SED. I was, mm -hmm. yesterday, I was sitting out in a bigger audience than this, and I was on the stage with the four leaders of the SED, John Kerry, Jack Lew, Yang Yashira, who's Kerry's counterpart, Wang Yang, who is Lu's counterpart, looking at a whole sorts of cabinet members of uh, China, their, their top ministers and US cabinet ministers, and doing a, 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 a moderating a panel on climate change and what the US-China announcement meant and you know what it meant to each side and what they were gonna do to follow up on it. And, to, to begin with, 
I, to, to give you context, I had, I, I had never had a, a particular interest in foreign policy and never really even had a particular interest in China. I had been here in Chicago working with Goldman Sachs, was a, a uh, you know, became co-head of the investment banking division one of my co-heads wanted to cover Europe and said, Chicago's closer to, to Asia, why don't you take China? And so, <laughs> but I, 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 so I, you know, sometimes you, know, you can't make this stuff up, but, but w when I got there, uh, and the first part of the book tells the story, I found the, the culture very different, obviously the history different, the language different. At first it just seemed very, very foreign, even the way you met sitting around these horseshoes and with interpreters. But very soon I found out that I really got to know the people. They had very similar senses of humor. They were, they're, they're, I found relatively easy for, for, for Americans to deal with. But so then as I worked with the Chinese and worked with the leaders, because it was different than other countries, because these were the leaders that they, they were, their, their leadership was about the economic, their economic decisions. And what they were doing was working to open up their country to Western capital and know-how. But as I watched how they made decisions, and I watched how the US government dealt with them, I realized we weren't dealing with them properly and that they had diffuse leadership. Many people, even if they didn't have direct responsibility for, for an area, weighed in and, and, and could kill a decision. And they were confused because they didn't understand how our government worked and we came at them from all different angles. So the idea of the SED was the Strategic Economic Dialogue, was to get a large number of people in the room those that had responsibility for a, a given area and those that didn't. So if I wanted to talk about the environment, we set up the 10-year framework on energy and the environment, I wasn't just talking to the environmental minister who didn't have a lot of power, but I was also talking to very senior people about that. Well, this was a way to prioritize and their, 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 their system works much, much better when you have clear direction from the top which helping form a consensus below. Now, to get to your question, it's taken me a long time to get there, but that the, you can have all sorts of common interests and shared interests, but if you don't turn those into tangible accomplishments, you are, they're not gonna mean anything. And so the strategic economic dialogue was not about dialogue per se, it was about dialogue, long-term issues, but getting things done. And so the point we made all along was you can have the best of intentions and you can have great understanding, but if it, each country has got to see the value of that relationship because it's so complex and so difficult. So you need to get things done. We call them deliverables, signposts along the way. So I won't talk about this, you know, the strategic economic dialogue, I could list a whole series of things we accomplished during our dialogue. But the biggest one was during the financial crisis. I was talking with my counterpart, Wang Qishong, who I'd worked with for years before I was Treasury Secretary, and the Chinese worked very, very constructively with us all the way through, and that was based upon trust and constant communication, and there was a lot of actions, or actions they didn't take, that came out of that. Now, the when you look at what's coming out of the, the, the strategic and economic dialogue today, there's a whole number of things that are being accomplished and getting done, so it's not just talking. And then the issues where w w w the, that are very difficult to resolve, at least, you know, the, the key thing is to, is we can't let those preclude us from working together when we can get things done. But the Chinese understand strength, so that's only one part of it. The most important things we can do is fix our own economy. We've got to be strong militarily, economically, diplomatically. But well, I want to get into uh, to some of these uh, very thorny right. issues in a minute, but let's just stick with relationships. You mentioned in your book that 
you found the Chinese, that you could do business with the Chinese because they're pragmatic, because they're relationship driven, right. a good, similar sense of humor. Um, you mentioned a, a very memorable anecdote on 9-11 when you were, um, you were due to be flying back to the US, but the plane had to be turned around, um, uh, and you had to go to Hong Kong because they'd closed the airspace here. Um, and you had a meeting the next morning with the senior Chinese official, um, and you waited for him to say something about 9-11, and he said nothing, zilch. Yeah. Um, and that really struck you. And it struck me that the subtitle of your book is um, Unmasking, Unmasking uh, a, a New Economic Superpower. Um, does, does China wear a mask, in your view? Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing, because I, I would say, in terms of the anecdote, that guy stood out, because, of course, everyone else, they're so empathetic. Yeah. And, and this was a guy who was, on top of everything else, it turns out he was a crook. You know, so he he's since been done for corruption. Yeah, right? and he, 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 he's, he's on the lamb in, in uh, Australia someplace, apparently. Oh, he hasn't been he, done for he, corruption. He, oh. he, he fled a, a long time ago. But yeah, I, I think that the, uh, that, uh, you know, there's, does it need to be unmasked? Yes. Because on the one hand, the Chinese people, at least I found, in terms of doing business, it was difficult to get a handshake, but when I got a handshake, I felt better about them sticking to the, to the, to the arrangement than I did in a lot of other places in the world where they had advanced legal systems. This was a country that doesn't have the institutions they need to govern, doesn't have a legal system that works the way it needs to work. So it's a relationship that's more run by men than by laws, so the relationships were, were important. Mm -hmm. But yes, un unmasking, there's a lack of transparency th throughout the country. I mean, transparency is just, you just, just even writing a book in China, you realize that there's so much drama everywhere, but we're just fact-checking, getting the facts to, to uh, so transparency is, is a problem. So what, one of the relationships you have developed over the years is with Xi Jinping, the current president. Yeah. Um, and again, very interestingly, you describe him as the most powerful leader China has had since Deng Xiaoping, but the most ideological since Mao Zedong. Um, explain what you mean by, by ideological. Well, I have never heard not only so much rhetoric about the party, mm -hmm. But he has, so I would just step back and say, so, so this is a man that is incredibly, incredibly ambitious mm -hmm. about transforming the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he inherited a country where there had been, hadn't been reform, it stalled for 10 years. And so he's not, not only has to come up with a new economic model because it's run out of steam, but he's looking at the changing the social fabric uh, of, the, of the country. So you, you're just looking at and the political fabric because he is he views the party. You know, I think when he his number one priority is to keep the Communist Party in power, mm -hmm. and he believes the party. He looks at it as that institution that is the source of stability in China the one that's strong enough to drive reform. And so um, you have, he's been very, very clear that he doesn't aspire to ever becoming a Western-style multi-party democracy, doesn't aspire to Western values. He wants a good, pragmatic, a good relationship with the U.S. He thinks that's very important. But so at the same time, he is, he is saying, with regard to the economy, I want the markets to be decisive in allocating resources. I want to free up the, the, the economy, the government's too involved in the economy. At the same time he's doing that, he's, he's, he is tightening the, the political controls, tightening the controls in, in, in terms of uh, the internet and, and certain uh, personal liberties. And, 
and he's, so he's taking a very dim view of anything that undermines the authority of the, uh, of, of the party. Now, we look at this, and I look at this, and we, you know, Westerners, we say, boy, there's, there's a big contradiction, right? <clears throat> because, but to him, again, the party is the, the source of stability. We look at it, and I look at it, and say, how can you be successful economically over the long term if you don't have a free flow of ideas? If you, you know, isn't that where innovation comes from? I've run a global company in an information age. You know, I need to be connected with what was happening everywhere in a political system, regulatory system, with, with the views that people were to to, to to. But for him today, I think it is pragmatic and ideological because when you say what do the Chinese people care most about today, it's the, the economy, you know, getting the jobs, they, they desperately need reform, the dirty environment, the, the property rights, some of the, uh, the big income disparities. Uh, so he's, he's corruption, he's got this huge, that's, you know, I, I don't know how I forgot to mention that when I t talked about him because He's, he's attempting to rectify, purify the party. He sees corruption as, as, as something that can take the party down, will take the party down if he doesn't deal with it. And he's already punished a quarter of a, more than a quarter of a million people and some very senior people. So I think it would be interesting to see right now, you could be pragmatic and ideological at the same time. I think when you have another 300 million people go to the cities, and if they succeed in fixing their economic problems, the, the people are going to want more, and it's going to be the, the two will collide. So the, 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 there is some tension between the two, though, isn't there, in terms of China and the world? I mean, if you yes. look at the, the Silk Road, the new Silk Road, the one road, one belt yeah. overture, the, the massive infrastructure plans that Xi Jinping yeah. um, building through the region, the link, the trade links, on the one hand. And then on the other, these pretty aggressive um, land reclamation projects, the, the Great Wall of Sand, as they call it, in the South China Sea. I think Ashton Carter said 2,000 acres have been built on in the last 18 months. You know, they're places that can yeah. play host to, to nuclear submarines, landing strips for military, etc. There is a tension between these two Chinas, isn't there? Wh which is the real one, or are both in competition? Well, well, well there, there is, uh, yeah, I, I tell you, one of, the, one of the tensions I see, but really to, to, to get to that, this is a, a man that is reinventing or transforming all aspects of China. So the foreign policy, for instance, used to be from, you know, right from Deng Xiaoping right up to Xi Jinping, it used to be lie low, focus on domestic issues. And, you know, as the, the current Chinese ambassador said to me, it's quite natural now that China's got economic interests and interests all over the world, that the foreign policy is going to be, you know, more proactive and respond to the issues that we now have to deal with as a result of our, uh, of our greater interests. But that the, you know, Xi Jinping is also, he's, he's, his big focus is not is when he's looked at the party. First and foremost, all the issues he focuses on are domestic issues because he's got a tremendous. I mean, to, to reboot a ten trillion dollar economy, to deal with the dirty air, the dem, dem, demog, demographic issues, aging the population, and so on. But when he looks elsewhere, he's looking to restore, you know, the, you know, the the glorious days of, of, of China, and and he's not waiting for anyone to declare China a a, a great power. He sees China as, as a great power, and he's doing what every other great power has done, including the United States of America, looking to, to, to do things to, to further their interests around the world. He doesn't know of any great power that doesn't have a strong military, and um, and what you pointed to, which I think is a, a, a is something I'm really quite concerned about, are these tensions and the islands and, and, 
in, in the South China Sea. I think the, although you always have to be concerned about, you know, you know, conflict breaking out, I think the, the real risk I see is that the whole world has benefited from economic in, integration and exchange in, in this area. And as these, in these security tensions be, become significant enough, I, I think they threaten to disrupt you know, the economic integration and, and engagement that's going on. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that the China's peaceful rise and how we've sort of perhaps moved into a different phase. Right. Um, there's been a paper I know you're aware of out recently by Robert Blackwell, the your right. former colleague in the Bush administration, and, right. and Ashley Tellis, that argues that we should be getting a lot tougher with China. Um, the Obama administration is too supine. Um, that for 30 years China has basically had a free re ride on Pax Americana, on the US global-led system. It's made a lot of money out of it. It's made us money too. Um, uh, there are many positive sides to it, but it's using some of these surpluses to build a, a potentially very threatening military capability. And it's changing its diplomatic course in ways that don't suggest necessarily a happy outcome. Is US strategic engagement on a geopolitical level under the Obama administration and, uh, and its predecessors, is it correct? Are, are, we, being, are we misreading China? Well, I, I tell you, I think, so let's talk about, the, 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 to me that is the $64,000 question, that's the, the question I get a lot. And I would start to, to say, before answering that, I would say, I, I think we can make as big a mistake uh, overestimating China's strength as we can underestimating its potential right now. I just want to start off saying that because this is a country that has enormous issues they're dealing with, and we haven't spent a lot of time talking about those today, but they do. But let me, but let me put that aside, because we are dealing with a new China, and a China that's transforming itself, and I really do think it takes a new approach, but it's a recalibration, because what people that make that argument, then, then, you, then you say, okay, where do you go with it, okay? So China is doing some things we don't like. Uh, we, we have to start off with saying we've always got to be strong, okay? So there's, I take a look when, when people say, well, is China going to displace the U.S.? And I, I say, well, if they do, it's not going to be because of what happens in China. It's going to be because of what doesn't happen in America. You know, we, if, if, if we need a make the changes we need to make in our own economy to be fiscally strong. We need to be smart about what we do with our own military. We have to be, we have to be economically strong. We have to be economically active. So I was, I was, I was, I'm really, really relieved that Trade Promotion Authority passed today in, in, in the U.S. Congress. But I was just sitting there a couple weeks ago saying, wait a minute, here we are that 96% of the population in the world doesn't live in the U.S. And I've got one party that doesn't want trade and another party that doesn't want the XM Bank or, 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 or to fund the IMF. And we're talking about being leaders. And so I think we need to be strategic and we, we need to be smart, okay? China may do and are doing, and will continue to do, a number of things we don't want them to do, we don't like them doing. We're not going to, it's in neither of our interests to go to war. We, I, I think it's in both of our interests to be talking about those issues, because there's a number of them where we do have common, where we have a common interest in, in, in coming to re resolutions. And there are all sorts of interests areas where we need to work together. And I, I, I start off, rather than dealing with it at 100,000 feet, is to say, let's just tick off all the areas where we have a shared interest. So you're talking about economic engagement. Are we helping the Chinese? Okay, is it, you know, that, that 
if, if people don't understand what this economic relationship is at least as important to us as it is to the Chinese, when you look at at the value of two-way trade and the role that our that our companies are playing there, and and then further when you look at the economic linkages we have, I say that they are important glue that are going to help us ride through some of the these tensions we have on the security side, because I, I would say to you that our militaries are trying hard, but our militaries don't like each other much. And we, we and they don't like the fact that we're operating right off their coast, and and we don't, you know, we 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 have a, a a lot of a lot of issues and tensions. The fact that we have these economic linkages, and I happen to think two-way you know, investments, you know, are even stronger when you have foreign direct investments. So again, I see it's in our interest uh, to have the economic linkages. It's in our interest to work together. If you believe, as I do, that climate change is the biggest economic risk that this world faces, and the biggest risk to the quality of life for future generations, if anybody thinks we can make make progress there without the U.S. and China, the two biggest economies and carbon emitters leading the way, I think they're they don't really understand the world. Cyber, we've you you, you mentioned cyber and the cyber attacks. You know, I. I, 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 I abhor what, what, what's going on, but I think you've got to start and say that when you have espionage and one government collecting information from another, there, both governments do it, and there my anger really is more directed toward my government for not doing a better job of protecting our data. The issues that I get really worked up about. I get worked up over them all, but the b biggest there's cyber theft of intellectual property, because I don't think that, I think there is, that is a very serious problem, and no one has ever accused the U.S. government of breaking into any uh, company's computer system, taking intellectual property and giving it to, to, to uh, private sector companies. Yeah, I, I saw Michael Hayden, the former um, head of the CIA, mentioned that if he'd been able to do that to China, China's government employee database, he would have done it. And nevertheless, if, if China, a power like China... I'm not saying I would. I'm just, I'm not excusing it. I'm just... It's what I, I, I'm, 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 I'm just uh, simply... The reason I pointed that out is there are all kinds of cyber gets conflated, all kinds of issues. Yeah. Cyber is the perfect area for us to be working with China because we don't have global rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. And the two biggest economies should be working together. But when you look at it, there's cyber warfare. We've got a common interest. There's cyber, there's cyber terrorism. There is espionage, where one government collects information from another. There's a privacy, which is huge in the U.S., which is what extent should our government be able to use technology to gather information either from our citizens or, or, or from foreign citizens. There are all the national security rules that are put in place now that are making it more difficult for our technology companies to sell you know, their, their, their equipment in China and around the world and vice versa. And, and then there's you know, cyber theft of intellectual property, which is a, which is a different issue. Um. Now, I'm aware that we, we will need time for questions, so somebody will signal me. I don't know who, who it is. No, there's no screen when, when I'm supposed to stop asking, but I've got many more I'd like to ask. You will signal. Sorry. Okay. I should have known that. Um, uh, but I do want to ask you on the economic engagement front. Um, the challenge that China seems to be posing to the IMF and the World Bank, or at least to the U.S. leadership of these institutions, with uh, its creation of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. America's response in turn, asking its allies and partners not to join the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, they in turn ignoring the United States led by my country, but Australia, Germany, South Korea, etc., all rushing to join the AIIB. Um, China's exclusion from the Trade Pacific Partnership that you mentioned, TPA, was passed finally today. Um, 
It looks as if we have the beginnings of the challenge to the institutions of the American global economic order. Is that something, is that a diagnosis you would share, or do you think this is just a series of misplayed incidents by the Obama administration? I think it's the latter. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, the Chinese benefit greatly from the global economic system as much as any country uh, other than the United States. And I, I think they quite naturally, and we should want them, just like we, they're now a big part of the G20, should want them to play a bigger role in these institutions. And they want to play a bigger role. And we've worked. You know, when I chaired the Strategic Economic Dialogue, I worked hard to bring them into the IDB. And I think we should be, and we've been slow and in updating some of these institutions so that they can play a, a bigger role. So I want to get to the, to the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, for people, because I think that's misunderstood by a number of people. Uh, first of all, that the US doesn't do infrastructure financing. And China does more through the, their XM Bank and their China Development Bank than any of these global multilateral banks. And so China, in setting that up, and they said we want to set it up with the highest standards and we, we want to work with others, they were trying to do something that which they thought would be a benefit for the world. You know, that, and, and, and the U.S. made a, a double mistake there, okay? They, I think it was wrong policy because we should be, just like we're looking to bring them in, we should be looking to go into an organization like that and work for the highest standards. And it's not like there's any other, that, that our it, existing institutions are so great. I mean, the, you know, when people talk about, when I read about governance of the World Bank, people haven't tried to work with the World Bank if they're talking about governance. With this live-in board and the bureaucracy that's there, that slow decision making doesn't mean better decision making. So, but it was bad policy because I think we should try to work with them, but also it's bad policy because strategically, why take on a battle you're gonna lose? And it was pretty, pr pretty clear we we're gonna lose it. But all those that have written, well, this is some beginning, some end of the US influence or some big watershed event, this in, the, in history is gonna be some tiny little, little screw up with an administration that's done a lot of things right with China. And they didn't get everything right. You, you say you have a, a list of eight things we should do um, going forward in terms of the US-China relationship, one of which is give China a bigger seat at the table. What do you mean by that and why? Well, well I think that it was just simply in something like this in these institutions, okay? It's the IMF waiting, it's World Bank representation. Yeah, it's, it's, we, we did this in the Bush administration creating the G20, but it, it okay. is, I think when you've got, when you look at the role that the developing world is playing. And you know, when, when these institutions were set up, they were set up where the countries that set them up were responsible for most of the world economy. The economy is, the world has changed and these institutions need to e e evolve. And they can evolve and China can play a bigger role in them. Do you think China has ambitions to, for the renminbi to supplant the dollar as the global reserve currency? It'd be great if they had those ambitions. Let me tell you, it's a long, long ways away uh, that people confuse internationalization of the renminbi and using it to settle trading accounts with having a global reserve currency. And so for China to have a really a global reserve currency, you know, you gotta ask, why does the US have one? Because we, we've had stable macroeconomic policies for a long time. We have great property rights. You can. People in the height of the crisis, the financial crisis, people bought treasuries because they knew they could sell at any time and it was gonna be determined by the free market. We have an open capital account. So for China, and they wanna get there because it's good for their economy, but they're gonna to have to develop first class capital markets and there are long ways there. They're gonna to have to be open capital markets, freely convertible renminbi, market determined. They're making good progress, but I happen to think that we would, the U.S. is always going to have a, the major reserve currency or if we do the things we need to do in the United States. 
And if China can develop a true reserve currency, that will mean they have done all the sorts of things we'd like to see them do in terms of opening up their, their economy and their capital markets. It will be better for all of us. I'm getting a signal for questions, but I'm going to slip in a couple of final ones of my own. One is um, the penultimate one. Um, it is about the two Henrys, just to go back to where we started. Now, the, the criticisms leveled at, at you and Henry Kissinger is that you're too positive about China, that you're too dovish on China's future and how it's evolving. And you yourself have mentioned people come up to you and say, why are you helping China? Right. What, what do you say to that? I am a patriot. I'm helping the United States of America. The reason I don't love getting on flights, going 13 hours, breathing the dirty air, and so on, but the, that the, but I really, I, I, I go to where I started. I think this is the, this relationship, more than any other one, the U.S. and China, will determine you know, a lot of events for the people in the world over the next century. And, uh, and, and so I'm never for being, I, I, I start off, I assume the Chinese will do what's in their interest. So we better do what's in our interest. And what, what that means is that it's in neither one of our interests to go into conflict. And there's a lot of, we have a lot of common interests. And so where I'm working, okay, which is, is easy for me, so, so it's a no-brainer where I work. I care about, I care greatly about the environment. And when you look at China, a, a country that half of the buildings in the world going up in the world are going up in China. 40% of all carbon emissions come from buildings. So if I care about the world my, my, my grandchildren live in, I want to see energy efficient buildings in, in, in China. Half of all cement, steel produced and built is, you know, it, it, produced and used to consume in China. When I look at China's impact on the global ecosystem, whether it's Latin America or Africa, it, it is significant. And also when I think about the economic issues and the bridges that I think we, I happen to think that the more Chinese investment we get in the U.S., it creates jobs. And it, 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 we're, we're talking about real, real, uh, you know, thick linkages. So I want to build those linkages. And, you know, I've always been pragmatic. And, you know, been, I, I'm, you know, I think they understand strength. But strength isn't just come from, you know, saying, let's keep building. I want to have a very strong military. And we better have and continue to have the strongest military. But it's not, I, I'm a big believer in diplomacy, economic linkages, and, you know, and working together. I think if we try too hard to look at China as an enemy, we might end up making them into an enemy when we don't need to. Uh, and my final question before um, giving it over to the audience is about censorship. By any measure, there has been a crackdown. China has gone backwards in the last few years. Bloggers have less freedom. Um, public expression is more constrained, etc. Um, so, slightly cheeky question: um, Will you allow your um, translation, Chinese translation of dealing with China, to be published um, if it's censored, if it's edited, if it's cut back, as often happens with with translations in China? No, I won't. Uh, and a matter of fact, as you look at at, at my book, and chapter 19 is called "The Party Line." And so I talk very directly about what's going on and you know, about what's going on with the media and the internet and all of those issues. And so what I've done, the book has not been published yet. And uh, it's being translated. It, it, it's being translated. And the deal I have with a publisher, and, it's, it, and, and the publisher would be publisher of someone I've known for a good while. And we don't know what, what, what the odds are because there, this is an unusual book, not only in some of the things I've written, but the number of not only past but current leaders that figure prominently in the book. So the path I'm going down is that um, we're, we're going to take a good while, translate it. I'm going to check very carefully. And 
it, it can't be changed. And so it's gotta to have to be translated accurately, which is very difficult to do censorship aside, just in terms of the, some of the financial terms and so on, you know, the, to, to get it translated properly. And then if, if, it, if it doesn't, if they say it's certain things have got to be omitted or got to get changed, I won't approve it. It won't be published in China. In that case, then I will publish it in Hong Kong or someplace else for that translation. Interesting. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, I presume we've got mics around. Um, I'm here. People put their hands up. Yes, the gentleman in the second. Um, is somebody else to say? What's the system? Yeah, hold, hold on one second. We're going to bring the microphone yeah. to you. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Right. Secretary Paulson, uh, you mentioned that you, I believe, abhor uh, the theft of intellectual property that goes on uh, with respect to China. Can you comment about China and their growing um, mistreatment, is an understatement, but uh, of foreign businesses in China, but, you know, predominantly U.S., but also there's those from Germany as well that have been mistreated? Yeah, well, let me say that because I think I, I'm very, very uh, sensitive to that and very aware of what's going on. And, but let, let's, let's set the stage. And so I'm just going to be even handed on this, okay? There are many, many significant companies from the U.S. and from, from Europe that do a lot of business in China today. And it's a very big part of what they're doing. And there's more foreign investment in China than there is Chinese investment in other countries, number one. Number two, a lot of those companies in the past, even though the regulations don't call for it, have been given sort of super national treatment. They've been given very, very good treatment. And so now what has been going on is it's become much more difficult in a number of respects and for different reasons in different industries. First, China is wanting to develop its own, as a major country, its own regulatory system. And so there are, there are regulations that are being affected. And it is... In some cases, there may be regulatory capture where the domestic competitors have, are exerting influence on regulators. In others, it's just the, the, they're getting, it's draft regulations and they're, there's, there's a, a difficult growing period. And then they have different tactics altogether. So the dawn raids and, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a very messy period. But at least the companies that I followed, most of them that I know of, they've come out of that and they're still got big markets in China and are doing relatively well. There then is another set of issues that has to do with technology, which is, uh, is of great concern to me and, and there's not, it's gonna take a while to work through because as a result of these national security issues and governments using technology to gather information. And of course, we've been very careful in our country in terms of uh, with our CFIUS law, which is the, that's a committee on foreign investment in the US that I used to chair as treasury secretary. And so we've been very careful in terms of not letting certain Chinese technology into the US. And so we have our, our technology companies, there's, you name them in no particular order, but Microsoft, IBM, Qualcomm, there are all kinds of U.S. companies that are, are, are sell technology, which is very important to China and very important to our countries. But so there now, as there's been fits and starts in China with national security types wanting to prohibit U.S. technology or to ask for source codes or other things, which we have done I will say in the U.S. also, and uh, and now there's been a relaxation of that, and so there's there, that's still a subject that's being debated and discussed in China. So what what I say is that there 
U.S. companies, German companies, all sorts of foreign companies have significant issues. They've got significant opportunities, and it's it's hard to generalize because it's different by different different industries. All right. The first question was a good example of our format. Just raise your hand if you have a question. I'll call on you and try to keep it short. Well, so can I just say one other thing? Because it really comes out of that big time. But but I think it's it, it, it's in addition to the economic relationship, it is really hurt the overall relationship between our two countries because businesses used to be strong advocates for a relationship and now businesses when they're talking to members of Congress or the government they're complaining and so that's that's another thing that's stressing the relationship. Sure. Let's go right here in the fifth row. Secretary Paulson, thank you so much for your comments and encouragement about China. You mentioned about people and the fact that it was foreign to you when you first went there, but then you saw that people were very much the same. Could you speak to some of the similarities and what advice you would give? I'd love to hear your thoughts on what President Xi Jinping is doing in terms of bringing up the youth of China that hold a lot of potential and the role of women in working with business and with politics. They seem to work very well in China with politics and have a strong role for women. I'm wondering if that's one of the ways you see us being able to possibly bridge some of the foreign nature of the country's well, relationship. Well, he, he, let me say two things about that. First of all, I really think that the people-to-people -people connections are in many ways the most important. And uh, students that have gone and studied over there understand the culture, the people, the, the relationships that are built. Uh, I, I talked about business, but I think student exchanges, cultural exchanges, these things are enormously valuable. And I'll say something that may surprise you about women in China, but the, uh, you know, I. First of all, I, I, I find everywhere I've worked, I've put uh, strong women around me because I, what I found is that every leader, you know, you've got strengths and weaknesses, and the weaknesses I have, I, I can best, you know, I, I get, women help me a great deal, and I, so I'm a huge fan of women CEOs, women in leadership, and Chinese women, my experience has been, are, are, are really, just like women everywhere, very, very able. And they've historically played a big role in, in, in private sector companies. But what may surprise you is despite the history of the Communist Party and some of the roles that women have played, women have a tough time right now in, in China and in government. And a number of the senior women I know there are, are, you know, have known are unhappy. Because if you look at, you know, the Politburo, or you look at the Standing Committee, you don't, you know, no women on the Standing Committee, which is a top seven. I, I think there's, I, I should know this, but there may be one or two on the Politburo, which is, you know, 25. When you look at mayors and governors and party secretaries, you look at the big cities, you see predominantly men. So I, I do think they, it is an issue. So if, 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 if you're thinking that we, we can look to China as a model, uh, the, China has the same challenge we have in the US and, and in, in, in some other parts of the world. And, and that, uh, that uh, for whatever reason, uh, women aren't playing the role that, that many women would like to see them play in, 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 in the top leaderships of the Chinese government. Okay, there's a question just behind her, actually. Secretary Paulson, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, my question is, we've, we've rightfully uh, focused on um, relationships directly between China and the US. Um, 
I would like to hear your thoughts about the, the global competition between China and the U.S. for influence in the Middle East and Africa specifically. Um, we see as, the, as the, the U.S. is drawing away from the Middle East after um, Iraq, the Iraq experience um, and Afghanistan, China's influ uh, influence is getting bigger in the Middle East, uh, specifically and in Africa a lot too. Um, Iraq's main production, um, Iraq's largest producing foreign company uh, for oil is now a Chinese company. Uh, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about um, the competition there and how the U.S. is withdrawing and China has taken um, that part. Yeah, well, I, right, I refer, refer back to, I, I wrote in uh, chapter, the last chapter of my book, and I write about U.S.-China relations, I write, I, I spend a reasonable amount of time on that. And first of all, I start off by saying we, we shouldn't, there's nothing wrong with competition as long as it's, you don't want Cold War debilitating a competition. But healthy competition is a good thing. And I alluded to it a little bit. And, and so I, I start off with, with our, our underlying economy because no one is going to want to uh, emulate the U.S. and our system if we don't continue to be strong economically at home. And I saw the flip side of this for a short time in the financial crisis. When my friend Wang Shishong came in June 2008 and we were pushing him to do certain things and he said, well, you've been my teacher on financial markets, but my teacher doesn't look so smart now. And, <laughs> and so I, I think it's, it, it's it, it, we have to start, the very first thing we do is do the things we need to do because we have the same problems that China has today that every other major country I can, Europe has. The policies that have served us well in the past don't work in, 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 in today's world. And all the issues we have about income inequality and so on. So we, we could talk a lot about we have to fix our political system. Then secondly, when we talk about competition, we have to be active. We have to be on the battlefront, the battlefield doing deals, okay? Trade, I think trade and economic engagement is very, very important. That's why TPP was very important. I didn't answer Ed's question about are we excluding China from TPP. I, I think it would be, I really want to do a bilateral investment treaty with China. We're negotiating with that. If they do that, that's one of the chapters on TPP. I look forward to the day that China be in the TPP. So we, we, China uses their economic linkages and deals as a way to help achieve their policy goals in, in the economic area and others. Just like we have, there's nothing wrong with that. We, we need to do it. Now, in terms of infrastructure and building infrastructure with government money in places like Africa, we don't do it, okay? And w w we have to compete in other ways. And there's plenty of things we can do in terms of with private capital. And China is looking to partner with us in areas. They really are. And we've, we, we've shied away from a number of instances. But there are plenty of ways we can work with China and Latin America and Africa. I also chair a Latin American Conservation Council. And I have started where we, we have worked with a lot of CEOs in Latin America on, on conservation issues. And I, I'm, now with the Paulson Institute, we have a sustainable soy project where we're, we're talking about, uh, again, working with Chinese companies and U.S. companies and Latin American companies. There's a lot we can do. They're going to play to their strengths. We, we, we need to play to ours, and we need to figure out how to work with them. But uh, you know, when I was Treasury Secretary and I traveled to, to Africa, I expected to hear, because I kept hearing from all kinds of people, well, the Chinese have these terrible practices and the Africans were going to complain about it. And all I heard was, why aren't you here making investment? We're glad they are. Now, but they also have some terrible practices. And so one of the issues that I think China is focused on right now, I have said that there's two big economic issues of the next 25 years are going to be the next 300 million people going to the cities in China. That will drive, they got a flawed urbanization model. That, that will drive global economic outcomes and environmental outcomes. And Chinese companies looking to become outstanding global companies as they glow out. 
And I say repeatedly, and they're focused on the fact that their global companies making investments in Africa, Latin America, Europe, the US, are gonna be the window through which the rest of the world looks at China. And if they wanna have the best, you know, we have best of class companies, they better have best of class governance, they better have best of class environmental practices, hiring practices, and all those sorts of things. And so, again, those are, but, but that is a, you can see brevity is it my virtue, but you've, that, that, but that, that, but to me, that's just such an important question you just asked. All right, we'll come up here to the front row and Phil Levy, our senior fellow on the global economy. Thank you, if I could, I wanted to follow up on the bilateral investment treaty idea that, that you mentioned. So two questions. One, what do you see as the major obstacles to reaching a bilateral investment treaty with China? And two, if the problem with China has often been not the laws on the books, but the implementation of those laws, how valuable is it to add new laws to their books? Yeah, I, I think it is very, very valuable because just as, so what, what you need to understand to begin with about what's going on in China on the, in, in terms of the economy, they, they've been so reliant on municipal, on, 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 uh, on government investment in infrastructure that they've, th that debt's been growing very quickly. They, they have a very serious situation. They're going to have to uh, place le less reliance on, uh, on exports and on government-driven investment in infrastructure, and they need the private sector to, uh, to, to create jobs. The private sector creates 70% of the jobs in China, but there are big sectors, sections of the economy that are, aren't open to the private sector, really, because they're dominated by the state-owned sectors. You could talk about much of finance, telecommunications, energy, a good number of areas. And to open up those areas to competition, reformers in China have always used, you know, used as a lever, international agreements. Zhu Anji, the legendary premier I write about in the first part of the book, Used, used WTO as, as a lever to, to bring Western capital know-how competition. So this bilateral investment treaty, I think it'll be a lever to help open that up. It would, but foreign, cross investment, Chinese investment in the US getting more of that will create jobs here. It really will, the right kind of investment and vice versa. These are important linkages. Now it's hard to negotiate this because our economy is open in most places, okay? There's certain parts of, you know, there's just certain sectors, very few, the def defense, you know, and, 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 and certain transportation, and, and, but, but basically open, and we have this CFIUS law of national security to, to exclude certain investments if they undermine national security. China, on the other hand, has a system where you've got to come in and get approval to invest. We can, we can come in, the idea is people can come in and invest in our, in our country there, we have to get approval. So they made a huge decision for them, which was to say they would publish a negative list, which would mean the negative list would say, these are the areas that are excluded, everything else is open. And so, now the negotiation is about the size of that negative list. And I think the, the biggest obstacle to this will be the political will in both of our countries to, because this agreement won't be popular in the US because no trade deals aren't popular and investments are even less popular. We don't like the idea of foreign investment other than when someone's working in a plant that's created by a foreign investment. We don't like the idea of our companies investing overseas, although it's good for all of us. So politically, and then this is gonna to be tough to negotiate, but I think it can be negotiated, both sides want to, and it's very, very important. All right, let's come over to this side of the room. All right, we got one in the back row there. Uh, Mr. Paulson, why would you say that China tends to invest more in infrastructure than the U.S.? Okay, well, there's, um, there's two things built into that question. First, in China, China 
invest in infrastructure that they desperately need because they're developing, right? So a developing country needs to build highways, right? And they, they need to build bridges and, and plants and so on. And then the other reason China is invested in infrastructure is mayors, mayors were, and party secretaries and governors were, and it felt a big responsibility to, to, to drive economic growth and to hire people. And so there's been excessive investment in infrastructure that's just plain not sustainable. The debt has grown to a dangerous level and they've invested in a lot of infrastructure they don't need inefficient infrastructure, so big waste. We are the opposite of that, okay? And, and so why we don't build the infrastructure we're building, it's, I've thought about that a lot, and it's different depending on what infrastructure you're talking about. But basically we've got all kinds of private sector money that wants to make good investment and wants to come in but so much infrastructure, there's so much, and again, I'm, I'm someone that's an environmentalist, I'm a conservationist, but there's so many regulations and so much political risk involving much infrastructure in the US. And so the projects get delayed, you know, they're supposed to be done in, you know, three years or five years and they go on to eight years or they get killed. And so we don't have ways of, building on a, on a fast track. There's all kinds of regulations about unions and all kinds of things that drive up cost. And it just is a, so we could spend a lot of time talking about what needs to be done in different areas in order to, to, in order to get the kinds of investment we need in infrastructure here. But we are flip sides, you know, and, and, and there's, we're mirror images on lots of things. We have, the Chinese has, have too much gover government involvement in their economy and not enough when it comes to their social safety nets. So they don't have adequate health care, uh, social security systems. That's why they oversave. We have so much, it's, it, it, it's, un it's unaffordable. And so it, it's just, there's just a lot of differences between our, between our countries. We have time for one or two more. So let's go right in the center here. Thank you. Uh, my question today is, as the relationship between the West and particularly the U.S. and Russia recently has become confrontational to say the least, we've seen a pivot of Russia towards China in terms of trade deals, in terms of uh, particularly energy exports. Would you say that this relationship is becoming or is growing in importance compared to the U.S.-China relationship, or how do you see that affecting the relationship between the U.S. and China if they cannot mend those the damages that have occurred? Yeah, well, let's start with, which I, I, I probably should have said at the beginning of this, which is China, not only do we see China, many people in the U.S., as our most important bilateral relationship, they see us as by far their most. Because there's no doubt in anybody's mind, including the Chinese, is who's got the biggest, strongest economy, who's got the strongest military, who is the, 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 the biggest power. And so this, this relationship, the US, is much more important and consequential. Um, I, I tell the story in, in the book with, that dealing with China that just, you know, I won't go into that here, but, but there, there's been a, China and Russia have, have had a, have had historically a, a tough, troubled relationship. Big borders between the two countries, border disputes and so on. Those got resolved with Deng Xiaoping, but they, what, what has happened now with, with the West, uh, Russia's problem with the West, Russia really needs a, a strong China relationship. And so uh, this has really benefited China. 
So it's, it, it's benefited China because it's preoccupied us, and so it's, we, we have less resources to, 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 to put in the Pacific. And they've been able to work out some very attractive uh, natural gas deals, pipeline. There hasn't been, they've announced trade, there really hasn't been a, 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 big, a, a big uptick in, in trade. But Russia, so, and, and I think both China and Russia have been natural allies and they both talk about why they need a multipolar world rather than, a, you know, they don't see a U.S. hegemony. But so uh, clearly there, there, there's some natural interests there. But don't ever confuse, I mean, the, the Chinese are, are, are long-term thinkers. They understand the importance of this, this relationship. Uh, Putin needs them a lot more than they need Putin right now, and they're taking advantage of it. So let's go back in the sort of end of the row, almost all the way back. Th thank you. Uh, you've, touched, you've touched on this from different directions, but the Chinese economy has not responded well to various forms of stimulus for the last several years. And I think a new question being raised is whether they'll need to devalue the currency. Um, so the two parts of my question are, you, you can talk if you have a view on whether it's likely or not, but if they do devalue, do you see that as a stabilizing or destabilizing factor, both for China and for their relationships in the region? Well, so again, two parts to that. And we have not talked much about the issues that the Chinese economy is going through. But, but in my judgment, they're, 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 they're quite significant. It's one thing to talk about rebooting a $10 trillion economy, and it's another thing to do it. And so I, growth has slowed way down. They know growth is going to slow down. It has to slow down. Uh, they've talked about 7% as being the new normal. That's got to be optimistic. So w with the growth, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the quality of that growth. If they're just getting it from, from going back and, and, and building it with excesses and building up debt at the municipal level where there are sure to be losses, then there's much greater likelihood that there will be a really a, a hard landing and it will spill over and do great damage to the underlying economy. I tend to be cautiously optimistic just because the leaders understand the problem and they're focused on it. But this is a leader that, despite the fact he's amassed more power than anyone since, since, since really, I think, Deng Xiaoping or maybe even Mao, that they don't have a consensus on some of the major things they're trying to do involving the state-owned enterprises or the relationship between the central government and the provinces. So, and they're, and they're, and, and, and the reason monetary policy and some of the things they're doing haven't worked as well as you might expect is because the state-owned sector still plays such an important role. I mean, they've essentially, even with banks, they've taken controls off of the lending rates and they'll take controls off, you know, the ceilings off, caps off deposit rates soon, but they've, they've already let banks sell C CDs at 150% of the benchmark, so they've effectively done that. But that doesn't mean capital is going to be allocated efficiently because of the structural issues around the state-owned enterprises. Now, with regard to currency, I don't see any real likelihood that they're even thinking about devaluing their currency. They've been doing the opposite, okay? They, because when you take a look at what's happened to the dollar and how, as everyone else in the world seems to be trying to figure out how to drive their currency lower with, 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 with different stimulus and so on. And so the dollar has rid, risen. The Chinese, have, uh, the, the, their currency has really hung in there. And I think there's some disagreements. The IMF put out a statement that they didn't believe that the, the, the currency was undervalued anymore. So the, the Chinese are, are taking the view on the currency because given what they want to do with their economy and they want to have, uh, they, they want to have it market driven, want to have the right market signals. They want to move up the value added curve. Uh, you know, they, they, they see their future in, in which they already are doing, uh, manufacturing more sophisticated equipment and so on. I, I just don't uh, see anything like what you suggested unless there was, you know, a, a real serious economic uh, uh, 
the disaster in China. And, and again, I, I think this is, as I've said and written about, I take uh, real comfort. And you know, they've got issues. Many countries have issues right now. They understand them, and they've got competent people there, and, and they're working to deal with them. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is pre-signed and available in the back for now. Please join me in thanking Secretary Paulson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.